Meanwhile, in Tupac news, the shooting of Tupac Shakur once again underscores the violence that has surrounded this man since he shot the superstar. To Pulled up, open fire, Shakur and Knight. Tupac Shakur was shot several times in the chest. Shakur was pronounced dead. Machiavellianist, Illuminati, all through your body. The blows like a 12 gauge shot at Only Gab can do it like this. Yo, YouTube, what up? It's your homie Gab, I'm in the building. And this is Machiavelli Media. Natasha Bree. Natasha, say good morning to my, my listener audience. Good morning, good morning. <laughs> God damn, I'm smiling from ear to ear like this is incredible right here. MC Bree, man, I remember being a kid and seeing Bree, you know, on uh, MTV, Ain't No Future in Your Front, and then he had this, he single-handedly is responsible for my favorite Tupac verse. I never knew, um, you know what I mean? Shit, I gotta get mine, man. This shit is, look, I'm lost for words. Y'all know my money, money on my mind, finger on the trigger. <laughs> <laughs> Y'all never heard me lost for words. I'm lost for words right now. Sasha, what's up? Well, good morning. How are you? I'm probably more at a loss for words than you. <laughs> no, nah, man. I'm smiling from ear to ear. Um, so let's see. Let, let's start from the beginning. So when did you first meet MC Bree? And where y'all from? Well, we're both from um, Flint, Michigan. And um, <clears throat> I guess you could say met him. You know, we kind of just grew up together. We're from the same neighborhood. He grew up on Laredo Ave, and I grew up on York Avenue. So we were just probably just two or three streets apart from one another. Uh -huh. And our whole little hood kind of played together and ran around together and rode mopeds and stuff. You know, we all were just kind of close like that. So I don't think we ever really just kind of met. We just kind of grew up in the same neighborhood. Officially, as far as just dating or being a couple... It was well after high school, and we, we were kind of grown by then, and I think he had came back home and done a show or something, and, you know, the rest you know, is history. <laughs> the rest is history, what they say. So you said that was in Flint, Flint, Michigan? Mm-hmm, the infamous, SLI. Infamous Flint, yes, yes, yes. You know, outside of Breed, the only other person I heard at the time mention Flint was Mateen Cleves, that played um, the point guard at college. Basketball, I forgot. What, I think he played for Michigan, and he was talking about he was from Flint. You know what I mean? I was like, "Wow, that's where MC Bree from." That's what I remember screaming at the screen. You know what I mean? Um, well, I don't know why, because it's a ton of talent um, that has come from our city. I mean, it's always, you know, and and the thing about the talent from our city, we all stand proud. I mean, you got Dre Rising, Glenn Rice. Mark Ingram, Mark Ingram Jr., Jeff Greer, Ready for the World, Clarissa Shields right now. The list goes on and on right. and on. So, yeah, we ain't playing. <laughs> we won't, we won't play where we come from. We won't play. <laughs> right, right. That's dope. That is dope. So, um, uh, when did Bree first start rapping? You know, like the history of him picking up microphones? Well, I would probably say that he started beatboxing first. Like, I remember being in high school, and I remember him being in the hallway and disrupting class and things like that. It would be a crowd around him because he would be beatboxing. So I, I would say that he started out <clears throat> probably beatboxing and then moved more into rap. But he probably had his first single, like, on the radio and, in heavy rotation, probably by the time he was about, what, 19 or maybe 20. I think it was around 91, 92. Damn. Um, so it was early. He he was moving really fast. He was young, and he was one of the first people ever to, you know, 
put rap on the map as far as Midwest. He was the first artist to ever have commercial success in hip hop or radio um, from the Midwest area. So he kind of paved the way for like Nelly and Eminem and the Dayton family and, um, you know, other groups from the Midwest area. And he worked with a lot of those people as well. So, you know. Facts. Facts. Yeah, Bree, man, Bree was getting it in. Now, the crazy part is, you tell me when y'all moved to Atlanta, you know, you know, we talked off air, you was telling me about all the different acts that would come through your home, you know what I mean, and was building with Breed and, you know, was network, networking with Breed, giving people a little taste of stuff like that. Well, um, he came before I came. He was in Atlanta before I was. I kind of came along when we would come hang out at Jack the Rapper and Freak Nick. I'm telling my age a little bit, but, you know, that's all part of the whole Hot Atlanta story. Right. Um, you know, and I'm proud to be a part of that part as well. But, yeah, he was here before I was, but he was just kind of known more as, you know, things were just different in hip-hop then, in my opinion, than it is now. Um, it was just a lot more brotherhood and a, more, a lot more personal relationships. You know, they would come and sit at your table and eat together, literally. You know, and they just kind of hung out and their kids played with each other's kids and things like that. But he was known for the cat that, you know, he loved to cook and, you know, barbecue and do big dinners and holidays and stuff. And he really took a lot of pride in, like, if you were away from home or you were out of state and you wasn't from Georgia and it might be Thanksgiving or Christmas or something, you know, you always knew that you could go to his home and have a good meal, you know what I mean, a good time, and feel like you were at home away from home. Wow. So he built those relationships with a lot of artists in the industry, and and a lot of them still rock together, you know, to this day, just from meeting at Breed's house. Man, that's amazing because so many people rock with Breed. You know, we ran down um, the list. We, we, we ran down the list <laughs> yesterday, and it was so many names from everybody from, like, Outkast to, like, Too Short to E-40. It was just like, damn, Red Man, Eric Sherman. I was like, whoa, you know what I mean? Bree, man, Bree must have had a hell of a personality. What kind of a person was he, though? Was he funny? Because he I always get the impression when I look at him like he was smiling. And I was saying, oh, Bree looks like a jokester. <laughs> Was that, was that it? Was he talking to? Was he quiet? Well, it depended on what day you got, but overall, you know, he was, um, humble. I, I really can't express how humble he was and how he never changed. And when I say he never changed, you know, even if you go and do your research, he never changed his swag, he never changed his voice, he never changed his flow, he never changed how he treat people, um, and if there's one thing I can recall about him, he was the kind of person when he met you, for most people that he met, he often gave them a nickname. And every time he saw you after that, he called you that same nickname. He smiled. He always would have a big smile. But he was the kind of person, once he met you, he knew you. And the next time he saw you or whatever, like, he kind of treated you like the star or like the celebrity. And he was just really humble, like... You could catch him in the hood in any city in somebody's basement just, you know, playing dominoes, you know, just kicking back, listening to music. He was very approachable. He was really humble. Um, he he wasn't like no dirty cat. He wasn't conniving. He wasn't – he just never had that negative energy. He always really, really just had that real laid back, you know, either we're going to have a good time or a quiet time or no time. But he definitely lived his life his way. And, um, you know, he was just really known for bringing people together, for fellowship, you know, and just brotherhood. He kind of was like the link between many things. Right, right, right. So you have you have three kids with Bree, right? right? Yeah, he actually has five children. He has three daughters and two sons. And um, the three youngest children um, are the children with me. Wow. Man, so, you know what? One of the things I wanted to ask you about, shout out to the kids and the family, too. One of the things I wanted to ask you about was, when did he meet Tupac? 
Do you have any idea, like, uh, when Tupac came into play? Because I know for a fact that Tupac loved Bree. You know what I mean? Uh, I heard Tupac yeah. speak highly of Bree so many different times. Let's jump into that for a second because I know my audience is screaming, Gab, tell us about Pac and Bree. Get to the Tupac, get to the Tupac. <laughs> um, well, you know, honestly, I, I like to come from a real place, so I don't, I don't like to say things that, you know, I really don't know a lot about, so I wasn't there when they first met. I really wasn't around. Um, okay. When I came around, you know, I met Tupac before. I've gone to the studio, and he's been there, and he's been by the house and things when I was there. Um, but I wasn't there in the beginning. Um, I've heard a lot of stories. I've seen them interact together. I knew um, that Tupac really, really, really loved Breed. Like, he was a fan, and he was a friend. They both were Geminis. Their birthdays were all close together. So... Um, they had a genuine, a really genuine friendship. Like, you know, um, they really, really respected one another. Bree was really devastated and hurt when Tupac passed away, you know. So um, I think it was just one of them things where it was probably right after Digital Underground and kind of like right before Thug Life. Right. Um, and I think he kind of crossed paths with Bree and met him and, and he did some work with him and got to get mine, got to get yours. Um, Warren G actually did that track. A lot of people don't know that. So, you know, it's just a lot of history there with the legends. You know, I'm real big on salute the legends. I salute them all. And I really respect the hustle and I really respect the sacrifices they made. You know what I mean? Because it was tough back then. Oh, yeah. You know, that video... Gotta get yours, I gotta get mine. That video, man, had us in the morning, every morning trying to do push-ups and sit-ups and shit. <laughs> so much history. <laughs> so much history. Yeah, that was on Dre Rising's home, you know. Um, Dre Rising was in the video. DOC was in the video. Like, you gotta really, you gotta know your history. Right, right. Now, that is, I believe, that's the host that, that Lisa left out Lopez eventually burnt down. Was that true or false? Unfortunately, unfortunately, that that is the home. Hmm. Yeah, yeah, that is. That was. Yeah, that was. <laughs> yeah, yeah was so. Audrey Rogers. You know, but that all just comes from, you know, it was just, I don't know, it, it was just part of the circle. You know, they all were friends again, so, you know, they all rocked together. Breed needed a video done. I mean, that wasn't the only video um, there were other videos that he'd actually filmed, and Rising had cars in them and stuff. You know, they just kind of, that's how they were. You know, they were friends, and they all came together, and they just all supported one another and stuff like that. So, you know, tough times. We didn't like to see him hurting during that time, but, you know, that that is what happened. That is the help. One. So tell us, so is there any, like, untold Tupac stories you want to share with my um, listening audience, something we never heard, something, something wild, something funny, something that's going to bug us out? Give me something, give me something juicy. Um, well, I don't know. I, I mean, there is one story that I always laughed about. I wasn't actually there when it happened, but um, it's crazy because when Bree died, uh, Nina Easton from Ishabon Records, she came to me, and we had dinner one night, and um, this was literally probably like two days after Breed had passed. And we were at dinner, and we were talking about a lot of things, and Nina told me this story about Tupac and, and Breed, and she told me about the time that Tupac was in Atlanta, and he was supposed to be flying out to L.A., I think, to audition or something for a film, and um, he had done some work on a Breed project, and Ichabon owed him some money, and he came there on his payment, and um, Nina was playing, you know, slow walking the money, and he pretty much met it up. Um, he threw a chair through a window. I know that's a fact. There were stories that he, yeah, he definitely broke a window at Ichabon Records, threw a chair through the window. I heard he might have even pulled a gun and laid it on John Abbey's desk. I'm not sure. But I do know for sure Nina told me that, um, Pot had pulled, it had threw the chair through the window and broke the window out, won his money. But the reason why she was telling me the story, she wasn't really telling me the story about Tupac. She was telling me the story about Bree because she was laughing at the fact that Bree was standing there in the corner cracking up, like dying laughing. 
And John, Abby, and Nina, they scared to death. They don't know what to do. Pop them nutted up. He wanted his money. And they said, he, Bree, get him, Bree, get him, calm him down. And they said he just stood there just laughing. I ain't going to get him. I ain't got nothing to say. Y'all better pay that man. So, you know, but it tickled Bree. He thought it was the funniest shit that Pac was in there clowning and tearing them people property up. Man. But they cut his check. They actually, they cut his check, but... As I talked about how a lot of those stories link and one story links to another, um, Nina told me, I do believe that's actually the same day Pac was late on those flights getting to L.A. And they didn't want to let him audition or something. I'm not sure, but he cut a fool when he got to L.A. too. Um, what, what, a movie lot of that was, what movie was it? I don't know. I was it Hughes Brothers or something? He got it was something about a movie audition. He was late. Let they wouldn't let him audition. Something out in L.A. I can't remember because it was quite a long time ago. Um, and it would take Nina, you know, it would take the right person to tell the story. But she was telling me. Wow. That's, that's, one of the, that's one of the more wow factors. When I personally met him, he was very calm. Um, I remember the first time I met him, they were in the studio over off of South Atlanta Road. I think it was Kayla Studios. And, um. <laughs> it's funny because Bree would call home a lot and say, bring some ADATs or bring something like, oh, my God, the youngsters don't even know what that is. But he would forget stuff all the time, and I would have to go and drive stuff and drop it off. And I was pregnant with my daughter, Lexi, at the time, and that was the first time I think I met him. Um, I went to drop some stuff off at the studio, and he was sitting there in the lobby area when I first walked in the door, and he just kind of looked up. He had to do rag tied in the knot in the front and eyelashes. I just remember eyelashes. But very calm, you know, always, you know, say hello. And I didn't see him a lot. He wasn't around a whole lot after I kind of came around and, and moved in and stuff like that. But um, I have met him. Very nice. Wow. I don't know what much. I can't say much more about him, you know. You said a, you said a lot about him. God <laughs> damn. Yo, hey, this is a Gavin Sam exclusive with the one and only <laughs> Natasha Breed. I do want to say this, though, another little bit of pop history. My daughter, Lexi Bree, when she first started, you know, taking singing a little bit more seriously, the first little performance that she done, um, her first show ever was actually at the Tupac Shakur Center in Stone Mountain, Georgia. Wow. Um, and she did a show, I think she opened up for, like, OMG Girls. It was a small show, but it was at the Tupac Center, and... I was really, really impressed at um, the center and all the memorabilia and the history that they had and just how deep and intellectual Pop was and um, the artwork and just the contributions from the fans around the world that were just right there in one building and in the garden out in the back. It was amazing. It was amazing. I'm not sure if it's still there, but... Um, He's definitely a legend. I mean, he's definitely a legend. So, how, how, real fast, how did definitely he is a legend? How did um, Tupac's death affect MC Bree? Do you remember that conversation you and Bree might have had concerning Tupac dying, or you know, when was the last time Bree actually spoke to Pac? That type of thing, you know. Um, I'm not really for sure about a lot of that, and you know, I think during that time, if I can remember was kind of L.A. a lot, and, you know, Death Row was really, really famous and big at the time, so there was a lot going on. I don't think they probably were as close or probably had talked, so um, I'm not really sure as far as, you know, right before his death, you know, if they had spoken or not, but I do know that he was affected. I know he was hurt. They all grieved, and I think they were really in shock. Because, you know, sometimes you hear about it and just so much was going on in hip-hop back then. But for that to really happen, um, a lot of fans and, and friends were just in shock. Um, I do remember, I think he spoke to his mom, Miss Afini. Um, but, yeah, he was affected. He he was hurt. You know, he was hurt as, as any other friend that he lost back then or during that time. He was hurt. But he didn't talk about it a lot. And, you know, he didn't wear it on his sleeve. But, yeah. He was affected. It was a great loss. I bet, man. I bet. And I wonder, you know, one thing I do, I wonder, um, doing shows often after that, you know, performing that song and that record. So sometimes people would stand in and do Pocky verse, and sometimes they wouldn't. 
But yeah, you know, I'm sure he was very, very proud. Yeah, I'm, uh, working with Paul. Yeah. I'm, I'm telling my favorite Tupac verse right there, <laughs> man. That shit blew my mind. You know what's crazy though? Tupac was all over that Breed album. He wasn't just on that one song. Um, what album was that? Let the, let the audience know, you know, uh, what album that was. Nah, you got me. I gotta go look. I mean, Breed got what almost thirty albums out. Um, shoot, I can't remember. I have to go look it up. But yeah, there is a lot of intros, outros. There's a lot of little skits and stuff in there. There's a lot of stuff in the vault. Um, that Pop deal with Breed in the studios and stuff. Um, a lot of um, ad living, that kind of stuff hey, that man. he never released. Yeah, yeah. Stuff. He's in the background. Bing, um, boom, boom, and that type of shit. He absolutely. Yep, yeah, it was a lot of that. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you know, they they were like that. So um, the memories are there. It's, I think it's pretty cool that he was able to, I don't know, a lot of people don't really, I mean, I know they love that record. Um, they really love it, and they love it for Pops verse. But, oh, real, um, hold on, hold on, real fast. Bree <laughs> killed that motherfucker, too. Bree got busy on that motherfucker. Bree killed kill a lot of records that people Bree really don't know about, <laughs> though, <laughs> yet now. Yeah, busy. Bree said, I told you before, she <laughs> gives <laughs> yourself <laughs> goodbye. Many people, lie people lies to have. have. It's funny what a motherfucker do for math. I got fractions. Caught up in my everyday action. Come on, yo. We was rocking that joint, yo. He was. We, we he was, was giving it up. Well, you know, my man Pop coming that motherfucker crazy. I got my mind on my money. Money on my mind. Let me stop. Hold on. Let me stop. Because I, I could be the you whole You know, and uh, right Pop had a lot of love for Flint, too. You know, that, that kind of came along with the breed and him being so humble and just everybody that he really built the friendship with. Like, he would introduce City, not only bring him in his home, but he took a lot of people to Flint, and a lot of the artists like DLC, he loves Flint. Tupac loves Flint, and there's some footage and stuff. Oh, gotta kind of do your research a little bit, but there is some footage of them doing some shows in Flint together. Hey, really, I remember uh, Tupac, Too Short, Bree. Um, yeah, that Pac. There's a couple of interviews with Pac standing right downtown city of Flint and showing love. So yeah. Right, so didn't Pac, is, ain't Detroit the place where Pac beat the kid with a, beat a rapper with a baseball bat, something like that? I have no idea. I have no, I never heard that story. <laughs> that motherfucker was I crazy. beat somebody with a baseball bat? <laughs> yeah, Pac beat, Pac beat a rapper with a baseball bat. Or assaulted him with a baseball bat on stage or some shit. He went to jail for it too. But, um. Really? Yeah, yeah, he was wilding out like that. It was well enough. I don't remember the story. No, this was a Chris Tucker story in Flint. It's kind of similar, but it wasn't that. But no. You want to I mean, share it? You want to share the Chris Tucker story? Oh, no. You oh. know, it was just back in the day, you know, Breed, um, again, Breed worked with a lot of people, and, and they were, a lot of them were friends before they were famous. That's the thing. Like Chris Tucker, Dudu Brown, Faison Love, they weren't famous back then. They were hanging out at our house cracking jokes in the basement. And um, it was a guy in Michigan, Chuck Nice. He did a he was a promoter at the time, and he did a show. And um, it was Bree was the host of the show. He was the MC. It was like a comedy show, and it was Doodle Brown, Chris Tucker, Faze. Uh, they were all like really, really new. I believe this was Faze House. Very first show ever, ever. But um, Blue Brown did his thing on stage. You know, it's a lot of stories behind that one. But the most, the most story, the famous story was Chris Tucker. You know, you get to clowning people in the audience, and he was clowning the young lady. This long before the movies. Oh my God, the restaurants. Chris Tucker wasn't a household name yet either. But he was in Flint, Michigan, doing a show. And he's clowning a lady in the audience, and they get to arguing back and forth. And, of course, you know, Flint, us being who we are, she coming up on the stage. So she's walking up on the stage, and she approaches Chris Tucker. He panics. He don't know what to do. And he swings the mic. He slaps the girl with the mic. But the mic was still on. So when he was popping her with the mic, you can hear it all through the venue. And uh, she done laughed and went and got a gang of people, and it's so many cats outside, and they waiting on him at the back door, and he's scared as fuck, and he breathe, breathe, I need security. So, yeah, it was just, I mean, it's just stories. It's just so much. I mean, days like when they went on the road and they would do promotional tours, and 
It would be Avon, MJG, Ghetto Mafia, Bree, DFC. Like, a lot of this shit was Golf. underground back then. Golf. Yeah, oh, my face used to be at the house, and Bush was Bill. I mean, like, but see, when they would come around, they were like Brad and Todd. You know what I mean? So right. sometimes, you know, right. yeah, because they were genuine friends. They were at each other's house. But, I mean, he rocked with everybody from Tone Loke to Ice-T, and he would always talk about the elevator in Scarface house, and... You know, Tone Loke's house out in L.A. and Roscoe's and Bree was just, he loved all, you know, all over the map. He loved the Midwest. He loved Minnesota. He loved Michigan. He loved Detroit. He loved L.A. He loved the South. So, you know, he brought a lot of people together. He worked with a lot of people, but I think that's probably what he was best known for. One of the stories you shared with me off air was the Carl Canal Clothes. <laughs> I remember... <laughs> yeah. People don't remember Bree was wearing just as much Carl Canard as Tupac was. You know what I mean? And, and they always only want to mention Tupac wearing Carl Canard. You told me yesterday that Bree was getting boxes and boxes of Carl Canard sent to him. Yeah, I'm not sure um, how soon Pac was wearing Carl Canard, but I remember right before Bree had done some of those videos, um, Carl Canard had sent some boxes to the house. Of a lot of clothes, and um, he, you know, he wanted Bree to, um, you know, support and wear some of the merchandise. And I was actually working at a boutique at the time. Um, I was working at a boutique in in the Marietta area, and a lot of the jeans and stuff, you know, they were wearing the big clothes back then, like the cross colors and Jabot and stuff like that. Right. So a lot of the jeans and stuff were real big and baggy. And I remember we took a lot of the outfits. We took some of the stuff to a tailor. Um, the lady that at the boutique that I worked for, she took them to a tailor, and they had cut some of the jeans, like, into the big shorts and stuff, and they had monogrammed the breeze name on the back of some stuff, like, on the vest, and they had the stocking cap hats and things like that. But, yeah, they you'll see a lot of that. You'll see those denim vests, and you'll see a lot of the Carl Kanai gear all throughout um, those videos back during uh, that time. They both were wearing it. Yeah, those videos was something else back in the day. I mean, that video, that that one video in particular, I'm telling you, I can't get it on my head because that video <laughs> was like the the realest video I see. You got as a kid, it blew my mind because you had you can't make videos yeah, like that now. They got they had forty ounces and you know money on the table and guns. And you can see the you can see the lip blunts and this shit was just crazy. Like it was everything for a bad little boy to enjoy, like myself. You feel me? Yeah, okay. yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, women walking past okay. the camera, you know, you yeah, had all types of stuff going on. So, I mean, that was definitely definitely a classic moment. But, man, you said Warren G produced, produced that track. A lot of people didn't know that. Yes, I believe Colin Wolf was involved as well. Um, I'm not sure, like, you know, exactly what part everybody played. But I definitely know the major players were Warren G, Colin Wolf, and Breed and Pop, of course. But, yep. I do know that. That's fact. My homie Bree knew the time. Yeah. Brothers, I'm a crime. I gotta get my.